Hey, what's up? It's Matt, and this is Things I Should Have Learned in School, but didn't, which is why I now started this video series. Five. Okay, number one, what are the actual odds of having a boy or girl? In my video, The Law of Small Numbers, I used an example where I said the odds of having a boy or girl were 50-50. And even though that wasn't the point of the example, several commenters pointed out that's actually not the case. I always thought it was an even chance because I remember learning in ninth grade bio that when you draw a Punnett square of the X and Y chromosomes, you get an even chance for both. But apparently that's just not right, so what are the actual odds of having a boy or girl? This Minute Earth video explains it really well and you should definitely check this out. Basically, for every 100 girls born, there are about 106 boys born worldwide. This makes the odds of having a boy about 51.5% and the odds of having a girl about 48.5%. And in fact, before boys and girls are even born, there's about 150 boys conceived for every 100 girls who are conceived. So naturally, my next question was, why does this happen? And it turns out that boys are much more likely to be miscarried or stillborn than females, right? We go from 60-40 boy-girl before birth to 51 and a half and 48 and a half after birth. So there's a big discrepancy there. And after birth, boys are still more likely to die than girls. But interestingly, Mother Nature designed this so that by the time boys and girls reach baby making age, um, there's actually about an even amount of both. There are a lot of other cool factors that influence this too, but again, go watch Minute Earth's video. I'm not trying to take credit for what they've done. It just taught me something that I should have learned in school. Number two, the water cycle. Hi, I'm Alex, by the way. I run a channel called Technicality and I'm Matt's a verified smoothie aficionado. When I was in school, or, well, when I was in first grade, I learned a bit about the water cycle. You know, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, do a little jig. A matter of fact, there's a Magic School Bus episode all about that. We're evaporating again. I love this part. Ah, the good old days. But did you know that there's not just three cycles in the water cycle? There's well over 15? What? And most of those cycles happen right before our eyes on a daily basis. Let's take a look at three. First, sublimation. Sublimation is what happens when a solid turns directly into a gas. It just skips being a liquid. I actually talked about sublimation a bit in my Halloween Science Experiments video, so click the eye to check it out. Shameless self-promotion. Ha <laughs> ho. Ha ho. Ha ho. Ho ho, I'm Santa Claus. Anywho, in the water cycle sense, sublimation is when ice or snow is turned into water vapor. Now, where I live, this isn't really a thing, but where Matt lives, in Pennsylvania, well, it's a little more noticeable. On the other hand of the spectrum, there's desublimation, which is when water vapor turns right into snow. Second, infiltration. Infiltration is not the process of me bursting into a room randomly. Hey guys! Oh my god, he found us! Go, go, go! It's actually the name for the process of water moving towards the ground. This water could be in streams or sewers or just running down mountains. Infiltration ends when the water gets soaked into earth or rock. And finally, number three, evapotranspiration. I guess we're just smashing words together now. Evapo transpiration. <clears throat> Evapo transpiration. Evapotranspiration is when you add up evaporation and transpiration. Evaporation is, of course, when water in a lake or ocean or other body of water like that is converted into a gas, water vapor, and is lifted up into the air. Transpiration is when water evaporates from the pores of plants' leaves. Evapotranspiration is the net amount of water turning into water vapor. Number three, what is the difference between a state and a commonwealth? Okay, so I live in the state of Pennsylvania, except Pennsylvania is actually one of the few states that officially calls itself a commonwealth, not a state. The other three formal commonwealths in the US are Kentucky, Massachusetts, and Virginia. So I've known this for a while, but I've never really understood what this means or what the difference is between a state and a commonwealth. A commonwealth originally meant a region governed by the people, not a king. A government for the common welfare of the people. A bit of a stretch, but whatever. And now that I've explained this, I can tell you the difference between a commonwealth and a state is nothing. There's no legal or practical or political or constitutional difference between the four commonwealths of the US and the other 46 states. At this point, the usage of the term is purely symbolic, meaning that those states' governments are made legitimate because they are created for and of the people, not because they were once former colonies of Britain. In fact, these four states all called themselves commonwealths during the Revolutionary War and decided to keep the name ever since. The US territories of Puerto Rico and Northern Mariana Islands are also commonwealths, but for territories, the term commonwealth has an actual non-symbolic meaning. Their self-governance can't be taken away by the U.S. Of course, the symbolic meaning here also makes sense. The governments of Puerto Rico and Northern Mariana are made legitimate because they're for the common welfare of their people, not just because they're territories of the U.S. In reality, every state in the U.S. is a commonwealth because they're all governments for the people, yet only four states and two territories chose to hold on to that name because why not? Alex? Number four, U.S. flag respect. 
Did you know you're not allowed to put a flag on a shirt? Well, you're not technically not allowed to do that, but it's strongly discouraged. There's something called the U.S. Code, which is a book or code overviewing kind of the structure of the U.S. There are 50 sections to the U.S. Code, which are... Oh, we're done now? Okay. Some of them concern boringish stuff, like highways and railroads, and then there's that section on aliens, which I thought was about outer space aliens, but then I realized it was about immigration. Anywho, section 4 is the part of the handbook that explains how one should display and use a flag. This part isn't law because that would be restricting free speech, but it's strongly implored. Of section 4, there are many subsections, including but not limited to time, advertising, and the Pledge of Allegiance, but the one I find the most interesting, and the one I want to share with you today, is subsection 8, concerning how the flag can be used respectfully. There are 11 parts of subsection 8 of section 4 of the 50 section United States Code. I know, I'm just laying it all out there. Anywho, here they are really quickly. One, unless you're in a time of extreme danger, never display the flag upside down. Two, the flag shouldn't touch anything below it, like the ground. Three, don't put the flag flat or horizontal. Four, the flag shouldn't be on one's clothes, bed sheets, or drapes. Five, the flag should never be ripped, destroyed, or damaged, and you shouldn't put it in a situation where that might easily happen. Six, the flag shouldn't be used as a roof or covering. Seven, the flag shouldn't have any added marks, patches, pins, letters, or pictures. Eight, the flag shouldn't be used to carry other things. Nine, the flag shouldn't be used for advertising. It also can't be used on temporary things like tissues, and I'm not kidding, it can't be printed out. So stop working on that school project. 10. The flag can't be used on costumes or uniforms, but, quote, members of patriotic organizations, end quote, like firemen, policemen, and the militia, can put patches of their flags on their uniforms. And you can also wear a flag pin, but it must be over your heart. Side note, this is also the part of the code that, no joke, calls the flag a living thing. So, and 11, I don't have 11 fingers. And 11, when a flag is too old or beat up for respectful use, you should burn it. Or destroy it in another way, but the code officially recommends burning. So an open letter to our president, Mr. Donald Trump, who believes that people who burn flags should be imprisoned. Flag burning isn't only legal, but at a point it's officially encouraged. So... Number five, many of the scientists who developed the first atomic bomb did not want it used. So this is Leo Soward, one of the chief physicists in the atomic bomb program in World War II. He was actually the first to conceptualize a nuclear chain reaction and wrote the letter signed by Einstein that convinced FDR to begin developing nuclear weapons with the Manhattan Project. Despite everything Soward did to push the atomic bomb project forward, by the time it was ready to be used against Japan, he, quote, opposed it with all his might. Thanks to tons of declassified World War II documents, including a 70-person petition, we know that Leo Soward and tons of other physicists and biologists who worked on its development felt that the bomb should not be used except in a total last-case resort because they believed the bombs would lead to a nuclear arms race with Russia, which could put all the world's nations in danger of sudden annihilation. Essentially, Soward questioned whether avoiding such an arms race might be more important than the short-term goal of knocking Japan out of the war. You might be wondering why Leo Soward spent so much effort convincing FDR and others to start this program, only to now oppose it strongly. We were afraid the Axis would get an atomic bomb and attack us, and we would need to counterattack. But once Germany was defeated, Leo Soward's views and the views of many other scientists working with him changed drastically to reflect the petitions and documents that you just saw. Now, Soward and the others did say they would use it in a total last resort case, so let's look at what they define as a total last resort. Basically, they wanted Japan to be offered fair and peaceful surrender conditions, and if Japan declined them, and the US considered beating Japan quickly to be more important than the global ramifications of using an atomic bomb, then they could go ahead. But the US didn't offer Japan fair or peaceful surrender conditions, they essentially demanded an unconditional surrender, saying that if Japan said no, they would use a powerful new weapon on them. Japan didn't respond at all, the US took that to mean no, and less than a week later, the first of the two bombs was dropped. Fast forward to 1960, where, in the midst of the Cold War that Sillard totally called, Sillard was interviewed about the decision to drop the bomb. He said, Today, I would put the whole emphasis on the mistake of insisting on unconditional surrender. Today, I would say that the confusion arose from considering the fake alternatives of either having to invade Japan or of having to use the bomb against her cities. Sillard was thinking that if more favorable surrender conditions had been offered to Japan, we would not have had to use the bomb against her or her people. He went on to say that, by and large, governments are guided by considerations of expediency rather than by moral considerations. And this, I think, is a universal law of how governments act. Prior to the war, I had the illusion that up to a point the American government was different. This illusion was gone after Hiroshima. To be fair, we don't ultimately know if Japan would have accepted more favorable surrender conditions, but we do know that Sillard and the other scientists didn't consider it right or moral to use the bomb in the way we did. And it did lead to the arms race and Cold War with Russia, which they did predict. And that's it! 
I want to give thanks to Alex from Technicality for helping me out with this video. Good friend of mine, great YouTuber, go check out his channel. And in fact, in the vein of important Americans who were misunderstood or ignored, I did a video on his channel all about Bruce Springsteen's song, Born in the USA. Alex is also doing a Bruce Springsteen biography giveaway, and if you want to be entered to win that, subscribe to both his channel and mine, and leave comments on both this video and the Born in the USA video. Thanks.